Hello, welcome to the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. I am your host, Roy Kessel, and today we are very excited to have with us a special guest. We have Diane Billings Burford from the CEO of RISE, and Diane is going to share with us the amazing work that RISE is doing across the community for social justice, using sports as a powerful tool. Uh, RISE has built an incredible team and a really strong organization. So Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Roy. I hope I can. I've listened to other podcasts, so I'm hoping I can live up to it and we should have a good time. Well, I have no doubt that you will, and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time looking at the work that RISE does, but I, I want to jump back and focus on Diane for a few minutes and, and learn, you know, how you developed your passion for sports and for this space, and you know, go back and start when your first memories of sports and, and how that came yeah. to you. Yeah, I, you know, I love that. I don't think I, um, I, I don't ever remember falling in love with sports. It just was always a part of my life. So I was recently um, was doing a conversation with one of the coaches and two of the players on the Detroit Lions for Jackie Robinson Day. And um, I'm from Brooklyn, a working class family, but there came a time, I'm the youngest, where my mom had to go to work. And so I mostly spent time with my grandparents because everybody else was in school and I was too young to go to school. And my grandfather just loved baseball. Like, I don't remember a time not listening to the radio, like baseball on the radio or baseball on the fuzzy television. Uh, he was a, a black man born in the early 1900s. So for him, Jackie Robinson was the hero. Um, that was the hero in our household when I was growing up. And so, um, and then my older brother and all of my older sisters played basketball, some of them collegiately. So sport has just always been a part of my life. It's a part of my family. Uh, watching sports, professional and college has just been it's just in my DNA. My kids are athletes. So I, you know, I don't even know that I remember uh, or know a life before sports. Well, I think that speaks to the power of sports because it was something that was so in, ingrained in, in everything that you did as, as you were growing up. And as you mentioned with your family, it was just a, a center point of conversation and activity. Um, so as you progress through, um, Tell us about Diane the athlete. What what were your sports? Oh, well, you know, again, growing up, I grew up mostly in a basketball family. It's probably from being from Brooklyn, right? There were always courts around. And again, my older brother, my sisters, everybody balled, right? When we say ball, we mean basketball. It's very interesting. When I got married, my husband, when he said ball, he meant football, you know? So um, I've always loved football. I, I would say probably if there's any franchise I'm most committed to long term, it's been the Giants, you know, the New York Giants. But um, I so played basketball growing up. I went to independent school, even though I love sport. The truth is, academically, you know, that's a lot of where my aptitude has really been. And so I uh, started going to private school for middle school and for high school. And there I got exposed to different things. So I'm really excited by high school. I was playing field hockey, something that I had never been exposed to um, in the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, loved field hockey. Um, of course, I played basketball in the winter. Uh, and then I did uh, throw, I threw shot put in a disc, didn't love javelin in the spring. Uh, and that was back when it's been very interesting being a parent of athletes. To me, that was back when we played multiple sports in a year. Uh, so my daughter and my son, they play sports, but they really in some ways felt like they had to commit to one or two a lot earlier in their experience. Yeah, it's interesting in today's world how quickly it gets specialized at such a young age. Uh, I think when we were kids, um, not only did you play different sports each season, but even in the season when you were playing one sport after school, you would just go play other sports or yeah. when you weren't at practice. Yep. So it's uh, a different world and that's not all bad, right? Like only thing that stays the same is that things will always change. So, so as you progress, then tell us a little bit about your, your background on an educational level and then where you started from a professional level. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm a girl from Brooklyn. Uh, 
working class. So I uh, definitely my schooling, right? Education has always been important to me. I, I think the equity of educational opportunity is the first time I really begin to understand inequities and understand the difference that different experiences could create. And that was, I went through, I was identified uh, and admitted to a program prep for prep. And that was when I was in fifth grade. So that's 10 years old. But I think that really wasn't, it didn't hit home till high school and college. Um, and so I went to uh, Poly Prep, which is a great independent school here in Brooklyn, New York. I uh, went to Grace Church before that. And then I, um, I went to Yale for undergraduate. And then I took five years. I'd had a little bit of enough of school. I took five years in between and I, I went to uh, Columbia for law, law school and graduated that in 2002. So even that was a while ago. So, you know. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see when people have that experience. I know when I went to law school, there's kind of a split in our class. About half of the people had work experience at Northwestern and that half of those uh, had come straight from from undergrad, and it was interesting to see the different perspectives of what those of us uh, students thought versus those that had been in the real world and looked at it like, "Hey, this is this is a much easier pace than working in the real world." Yeah, definitely. I, I kind of love that diversity of experience. You know, I when I got to Columbia, I took five years, but I had only intended to take four and uh, was expecting my son. So I had to defer a year. I had my first child deferred a year, started when he was one. So my experience was different than quite a few of my classmates. And it's great, like a couple of them, we just got together this weekend. Even with us having that diverse experience, you, it helps you to get to focus on the things that do connect you to folks that you do have in common. Um, so grew some really great relationships in law school, but I was already a mom. I had already been working. Um, and by my third year, I have my daughter. So, you know, it was very interesting, even preparing for the bar, everybody's talking about, um, like bar prep courses, who's taking what, when, and I was doing that, but I was also thinking, okay, what's my childcare plan? How can I really just buckle down? And so thank goodness for my mother-in-law, she took both kids and the husband for the month of June. So I could just take the bar and I to let everyone know, I was like, oh no, I'm passing. This is an investment on everybody's part. I got one shot, let's go, you know? So thank goodness it all worked out. Well, I mean, that, that shows a lot of commitment. And when, when you look at the, the challenges people have um, in, in their lives, you, you had at that point, that's a lot on your plate to have two kids yeah. and going through law school and, and, and the bar exam and, and being able to balance that. So. Now that you've, you've passed the bar, then what was the next step for you? Well, I practice. I practice at a really great firm, Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. Um, listen, in my family, I think I might have been the first person to make that much money in a year. It was stunning. It was wonderful. Um, but the truth is, actually, right before, during my third year of law school, I also lost my mother suddenly, and there probably is no other no other person as important uh, kind of to me and my development, who I am, than my mom. And so it made third year a real challenge, and um, I, I still was grieving when I got to Simpson. And uh, when I started coming out of that process, I realized, like, this is a good place to be. I'm really happy that I'm making this money, but I don't think this is the type of work that I was meant to be doing. Um, but I, I think, you know, until that point, till I could come out of that period of grief, I, you know, you just, you can only, you only have so much psychic energy, right? And so uh, I was at Simpson. I think if I had stayed at a firm, I for sure would have loved to have stayed at Simpson, but I did not feel that that's where I should be. Um, I returned in a more senior role to Prep for Prep, the program that I went through. Because um, again, I really believe that this equality of educational opportunity can have such an impact on people's lives. Um, stayed in the ed space. And then um, Mayor Bloomberg, his third administration, or right before, actually during his second term, I uh, went and joined. I was the chief service officer there. Uh, really loved leading that agency, NYC Service, and focusing just service and people and the, the kind of um, 
the resource we never run out of, which is people and skills and talent. And how do we just focus that on our needs across our city? So that was an amazing time. I uh, spent about five years with the Bloomberg administration. And then I, uh, during that time, a lot of my work had been in public-private partnerships. And I just realized how much of our daily existence comes from those relationships. So I went into Time Warner to head philanthropy there and work with a, a great leader there on their foundation uh, after, the, after my time at the administration. And that led to this. So I was at Time Warner for another five years, loved it. Uh, and then with the acquisition of Time Warner by AT&T, I really got a chance to think about what would be next for me. And just a lot of things going on in the world uh, landed me at Rise and I'm really grateful to be here. Well, you seem to have a magic for the five-year uh, window for the <laughs> for the different roles there. But uh, I mean, it's a, it's an incredible background when you look at the the strength that you built up from the experience of practicing law and then being part of uh, you know prep prep to prep and um, the Bloomberg administration and and Time Warner. You really saw uh, significantly different viewpoints. Absolutely. Uh, from Absolutely. from the nonprofit to the government to a large uh, mega corporation. Yeah, you know, I would say that one of the, you know, we talk about experiences so much and the equity of experiences. So I, I think I couldn't agree with you more. And it really was early exposure and early experiences that kind of helped me frame the importance of these different perspectives. I was a White House intern. You talk about aging ourselves, I think in 93. And um, I, I remember sitting there watching Senator Kennedy at a hearing um, and thinking, gosh, if I was gonna be anything, I'd be a Senator. He like had five people handed him information to answer questions, you know. Um, but it also became clear to me that when dealing with complex problems, there really was no complex problem that you did not need all three sectors of society to have a hand in. So there was no con there was no complex problem where you didn't need government, for profit, and the not-for-profit sector. Like that, I, I, I have still not come up with any complex problem that does not require everybody having a hand in the solution. Um, and so, you know, I think that early exposure, because I was still in college at that point helped me to understand that I needed to understand all those sectors. If I was gonna have the type of impact I intended to have uh, in my career, that I needed to understand all the sectors and, and needed to be able to leverage all of them because I intended to have an impact on complex problems, so. Well, and, and I think as you said, everything is intertwined. And so when you, you try to pull that apart, you really don't end up making the impact or solving the, right. the problem to the depth that that's needed. And so having that experience in all three areas, I think gives you a great ability to lead an organization like RISE because you, you've got an understanding and connections within all three spheres. So what, what made RISE an attractive opportunity for you? Yeah, I love, um... I love sharing this story. I do believe I'm a fairly religious person. And so I believe that there are places we're supposed to be. And Rise is one of those places for me. I, uh, you know, we talked about a little bit about, about my background. So when I was at Time Warner and AT&T was acquiring the company, I mean, I had heard of packages before, but I had never like seen one, seen the details. And I was like, wow, so people pay you basically not to work, right? I come from a background where folks are trying to find jobs to live. Um, so this concept that you're gonna get a severance package, which is basically money to not work <laughs> at that place. It's a, it, you know, if you step away from the nuts and bolts of it, it's an interesting concept. Um, and so I was like, I want one of those. Like I, I've had great jobs and I've worked, but damn it, I wanna get some money to not work. Um, so. Uh, I was excited about the package and I actually had intended to just teach, not just, but to teach at a collegiate level for a year and live off my package and that, you know, collegiate adjunct money, which is not fabulous, but I didn't need it to be. 
Um, and the uh, election of Donald Trump was elected president. And whereas I thought it would be challenging, um, I really, in that first year of his presidency, I was, even I was taken aback by how divided our country was. Um, and that was lining up with the time where I was making decisions about what to do after Time Warner. And so this job description comes through, a person that uh, also, uh, his wife went to law school with me. I knew him from people at Simpson. He said, Diane, I think you should look at this role. And I said, nah, I'm getting my package. I'm gonna get paid not to work and I'm gonna teach and I'm gonna be good. Um, and he really asked me to look again. And I actually looked again, I interviewed, I had two conversations and the first, first search firm said, well, we were supposed to bring sports business people in you don't fit that bill, but you're amazing. So I said, hey, okay, you know, and literally I was leaving Time Warner one day and a second search firm person who I know from other interactions was in the lobby and said, I just got this position and I think the person for this position is you. And I gave her my same spiel. Nope, I'm, you know, I'm getting my package. I'm teaching, I'm good. But she asked me to look at it and it literally was the same position. Um, And so, I spoke to her about it. I let her know I had already spoken to someone. But um, after that interview is when I first met Paul Tagliabue, who had just recently come on as the board co-chair. Um, and so Paul and I had a great interview. I know that he interviewed other folks. They went well. The search committee of the board interviewed other folks. But I ended up at RISE after that. And um, it has been an amazing two and a half years where closing in on, on three years. Um, it, you know, I still have some of my first impressions from meeting some of the board members. And, and one of the things that I think the search committee was so right about is they said, Diane, you don't really have that much experience in the sports space. You know, they were asking me what I felt about that challenge. And I told them I, that was exactly right. Uh, I think I had experience in every other thing that this role needed. Um, I love sports. I think it's integral. It was integral to my life. But if we we're talking about from a sports business perspective, they were right. I didn't have the uh, connections, the relationships. But, you know, I, and I think this resonated with them because they offered me the position. But, you know, the thing I told them is with my board, if there was a learning curve that you wanted your CEO to have, that's it, right? That's the curve they can address. And they have just been amazing champions um, of this organization and helping me to address that curve over the uh, the last two and a half years. Well, when you look at the strength, as you said, of the board of directors and the sports and sports business experience there, it's extensive. We're starting with Stephen Ross and Paul Tagliabue at the top. I know yeah. you and Paul had an opportunity to do an interview at Sports Philanthropy World Conference last year. And... Uh, really getting that kind of leadership from the outset. And, and as you said, p having people like that making the selection in terms of who should come and lead the organization, they clearly believed in Diane and believed in the fact that you've got the right kind of background. As you said, if you're going to be missing one piece of the puzzle that you had plenty of support there from yeah. a sports business perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Some of the best, literally the best in the business I, I get to interact with and get their input. And so they, again, they have been, they have, many of them have been, I think, really gracious to me and, uh, you know, kind of thank me for my leadership, but, you know, engagement is a choice. So I think I have to do my part to keep them engaged, but they make the choice to be engaged and to move the organization along. So. So now, now you uh, you've come on. You take taking control at Rise. So you've been there, as you said, two and a half, coming up on three years. Um, was it what you expected when when you took over the position? Uh, yes and no. You know, I, I think that's yes and no. Um, I there were things I anticipated. So yes, it is. It was and is this opportunity for me to use my skills to have an impact to unify our nation. So at its core, it has certainly been 
what I thought I was stepping into. Um, I would say, I think from the outside, uh, the RISE team uh, used to be smaller and it is still semi-small, but mighty. And so I think it gives the impression that we had more capacities built than we did actually have built. And so it's been a little bit more uh, work on that end, but I, you know, I love the stuff. And again, the team is strong and mighty and so capable and so smart. It has not always been easy, uh, but it's, I, I think we, it has always been satisfying for me as a leader to kind of address those capacities, build them and grow our partnerships, grow our impact. I was just drafting an email for the board and just, the number of partnerships, the number of folks we've been able to reach, you know, and the, the stakes we've been able to put in the ground as an organization and what we do has just been amazing over the past two years. Well, you've got a very broad set of programs and, and information. And for, for those that haven't had an opportunity to go to the website, I encourage you to go to rise to win.org. There's some incredible resources and tools and, and trainings there you know obviously starting as you say with the what what we do educate empower and engage um, really creating mechanisms to bring people together to have these conversations yep. uh, at, at a very deep level and uh, I know it's going to be a little bit like asking, you know, for about uh, your favorite child or your favorite employee, but I want you to take us through a couple of your favorite programs that, that really stand out to you. Yeah, I, you know, I will say one of the just wonderful moments, because 2020 had some great moments and some challenging moments, same as 2021. Uh, but I would say this year for the Super Bowl, we, we, when I say we always, for the past three Super Bowls, uh, RISE has either culminated or commenced a leadership program with youth uh, around the Super Bowl. And so in the past, it's been place-based, right? So first year, Atlanta, second year, uh, Miami. This year, um, we were set to be in Tampa, but of course, the pandemic hit. Um, we realized we wouldn't be there, and the team really got creative. Um, and so what we did was we took this opportunity to say, here are young people that we have programs with across the country. Um, and what if we bring them together virtually, have a program that really is truly national, you know, focused on us educating on these issues and empowering them. And it will culminate the week of Super Bowl. And we still didn't know then if it would be virtual or in-person and it ended up being virtual. But one of my best moments has got to be that virtual culmination event, right? And that, in that event, we had young people from Southeast Michigan, Florida, um, California, New York in one program presenting. We had uh, executives from various, their, we had the students' parents, their communities, executives from the various leagues, um, and and the few professional athletes, and and you know it was just, it was it that was, I had one of those moments. We had Pepsi launch; they have supported us in our virtual Champions of Change. We launched that, and we got to put the students' projects on that, so people across the country could see. What happens when you empower youth in this space to create unity, right? Um, and so I, I think that probably was one of my, that definitely was one of my greatest moments this year. Um, and then, you know, I have moments of, I, I think I've said this on a couple of shows, I think there have been real, this is a difficult time. Uh, I think this racial reckoning is difficult and I don't think it's going to necessarily get easier anytime soon. It's a complex problem. and so. You know, as humans, we like simplicity. I don't think there are any simple answers. Um, I, I have had great moments of seeing the leadership that is on my board step up. Uh, I, you know, this has been a time of something that maybe has that used to be seen as a minority issue becoming a majority issue and leadership saying this is a majority issue. And so what do we need to do? Um, to address this and to make our country better. 
And so I've had some great moments. You know, um, I, th I think NASCAR's ban on the Confederate flag is a great example. Um, and so, like I said, we've had some low moments, but we've had some amazing moments too. I should also point out in that culmination of that, one of the best things was a young girl uh, from Denver, Ray Ray, was to, at the event. She still had to go to a basketball game. So she's at the event in a uniform. And she got to talk about um, a, a player on the Broncos, Justin Simmons, who was supposed to come to one session of our multi-week program with them and the Boys and Girls Club. He ended up coming to every session and he marched with them. And so just in that one event, right, you saw this power of sport through this young person, but also in the different levels of sports engaging with one another to push progress. So I've had some great moments this past year. And that event was was fantastic. I know we had a chance to be on that from, from Tampa when, when that was going yeah. on. And it was a terrific uh, to, to hear all of the stories. And as you mentioned, you know, having um, Justin be part of all of those sessions, makes such an impact on on the youth in the program because it then converts it away from somebody coming in as a celebrity to make yep. an appearance into somebody who's really connected and committed to the cause and to the mission and the message and too often i think we've seen athletes being sort of conditioned or led to believe that they're good for four things when they're not playing sports, right? Signing autographs, yeah. taking photos, playing in golf outings, going to fundraising dinners, all of which are really celebrity functions. Um, and really their true power is being part of that message and being part of the cause. Yeah, and just being part of the community. I get dawned on me. I was like, I don't even think it resonated with him that because he made the time, here was a young athlete that understood she needed to make the time. Like she literally made the time to attend this until you were there to her coach was like, you have to go now. Like the game is beginning, right? So there are also these lessons that our athletes can teach young people about priorities and character, and what's important and what's authentic, you know, that, that I think all of that was taught even on top of the RISE curriculum, you know? So let's go over to the RISE curriculum for a little bit, because I think you, you mentioned a six session program that that they went through tell us a little bit about what's involved in in those sessions yeah so it's usually between eight and ten and so for us um when we look at this challenge right we have this bold vision of creating a nation unified through sport committed to racial equity and social justice but in real terms what does that mean right because we're not we're not in the business of like smoothing over problems or being pollyannas but um for us, we think that there are substantive topics that need to be discussed. And on top of that, we think there are skills that need to be built. So, um, and, and we think those things are necessary to get to that point of unity. So from the topics we think we need to discuss, it's, you know, it's obviously race, racism, diversity, inclusion, um, equity versus equality. What does it mean? You know, um, so there are topics that need to be discussed. Uh, allyship, what does allyship look like? Inclusive leadership, what does that look like? Um, but we also are teaching skills. We think if you're truly gonna unify, be unified, you have to learn how to be empathetic. You have to, to your point earlier, you and I were talking about perspectives. You have to actually learn how to take someone else's perspective. You, we, we will not be unified if all we can do is argue our point. If you can't ever say someone else could be rational and have a different perspective than me. And I need to try to take that and I need them to try to take my perspective. Um, and so we have a number of skills that we seek to build. Um, we do it in our youth programming, but we also do it in our collegiate programming. And quite honestly, you know, one of the things we had hoped for at the end of 2018 was to begin to educate more adults and in 2020, we certainly did. So we are using the same approach with engaging adults, whether it's professional or amateur athletes or executives in the sports space. Well, I know you, you've 
you've engaged a lot of people. There's a, a ton of information on the website and, and all of the different modules and trainings there. I think as you talked about the equality versus equity component, um, I love the, the graphic that's on your website that explains the difference between equality and equity, because I think it's something that people often struggle with in terms yeah. of understanding those concepts. So I'd love to have you explain that to, to our audience in terms of how those are distinct concepts. Yeah, well, you know, the thing we say, and I thank you for that, I do encourage everyone to go uh, take a look at our website. In response to uh, COVID, we launched the RISE Digital Learning Series. And so I believe it's in um, our first course on the RISE Digital Learning Series, Equality versus Equity. There's this great conversation I mean, you know, I love the Giants. And so it was great because Tiki Barber uh, moderated it for us. Nate Solder, uh, who's just uh, amazing. He engaged with us even as he opted out last year. Um, and so we had a great conversation with them and some young people and um, about equality versus equity. And so we begin with this image that I think a lot have seen that I think helps to explain the difference. But if I'm gonna try to do it in words, it's just to say, if we think about for us, equality is everyone having the same resource, single resource, absolutely the same. Equity, if you think about folks ending up with the same experience, then what resources would be required, right? So we use that image of uh, three people trying to look over a fence and watch a baseball game and everybody has one thing to stand on, but the taller person doesn't actually need to stand on anything. They can see over the fence. And the medium sized person can see over the fence with one crate. And the smallest person, the youngest person with one crate, even standing on the crate, they can't see over the fence. So equality is everyone having the same crate to stand on. Um, equity looks more like the shortest person having as many crates as they need to have that same experience as the tall person. Um, and, and, you know, I think what we do at RISE, it's important to make those distinctions and provide those definitions, but then more it's the conversation about, okay, so what are the challenges with that? Because just because someone understands a concept doesn't mean it's without challenges, right? So what are the challenges? And um, again, I think Tiki said it in that conversation. He was like, wow, like this is the first time I realized that maybe equity feels like sacrifice, right? And so as a community, we get to have these difficult conversations. Does equity mean someone has to give up something? And we're all human. What does it mean when we feel like we have to give up something? When do we give up things? Why do we give up things? Um, and, and so usually we are, again, seeking to have people talk about these issues, but also learn skills that allow us to not only talk about these issues, but implement maybe the changes or adjustments we need to make as society, to, you know, to be more equitable. And I love the the last image that's on that page as you talk about the the equity, right? When the, the younger kid can now have two crates to see over, but really talking about what's the solution in the long run, which is to get rid of the fence and to get rid of the obstacle so that everybody in, in the community can, can share the positive experience without needing, as you said, somebody else to sacrifice their right. experience to, to let um, the, the younger individual have the view of, of the game. Yeah, and we use it all as an analogy, right? Like, you know, what are the things that we can look at, the structures we can look at in our societies where that could be the case, where the challenge is we are, we're requiring folks to share resources, but if in fact, if we made some adjustments to the system, um, you know, you know th that would probably be the more systemic solution as opposed to individuals having to work together to overcome the systemic challenges. So, you know, I, if we use sometimes to give a real example, again, I tell folks about going through prep for prep. Prep for prep was amazing. But for me to get through prep for prep, someone had to raise private money to take me through 14 months, me and my peers through 14 months of intensive learning to go to independent school, to get scholarship money to go to independent school, 
to have a particular experience. Imagine if we took away some of those fences, right? Because that, that, that program certainly addresses and creates equity, right? It says to a person who's good at school, me, and who's going to do the work, me, here are the resources you need to see over that fence. But imagine if the fence wasn't there. Imagine if we had just really awesome schools in poor areas. Imagine if we had access to great colleges for kids from, from different backgrounds. And so, you know, again, the, the activities we do at RISE, it's, it's to push us to think. And then we try to take folks, okay, let's apply that to real life and let's start asking some questions and see if we can come up with some solutions together. Yeah, and that's a really important point because the the struggle to provide that type of education, that's been your theme from the beginning when you talked about the, the equity of, of education and um, giving everybody that opportunity to learn from, from yeah. a young age all the way through college and, and frankly beyond because there's so many people that uh, may manage to get through uh, a college um, and then are working in jobs where maybe they're not satisfied. They would like to continue to pursue yeah. their career, uh, just as you did work for five years, um, and then have an opportunity for law school or grad school or whatever other factor. And and yet that those finances again become an obstacle in their ability um, and and their commitments to their family to take care of their yeah. obligations at home prevent them from being able to juggle as you were able to, in terms of law school, family, everything yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, and even the, you know, the exposure, you know, I've, I've worked for a little while with a, a foundation that's committed to breaking, you know, cycles of poverty. And one of the things I think I, I love that you alluded to is that poverty can be, is often defined by uh, how much money comes into a household, but they're all, there's so many other ways to define poverty. And some of it is just a lack of exposure, right? In some ways, um, I, I, through my education, was just exposed to see different things. And, and what you see, I believe it's a natural human inclination to figure out what resonates with you and what you want to do. But if you never see it, why would you ever even have that opportunity to figure out what resonates with you and what you want to do, right? It's not lost on me that I was sitting there looking at someone be a U.S. senator, right? Like, but that is not everyone's reality. Like tons of interventions had to happen. So I ended up in that space and had that exposure. Um, and so, you know, to your point, I, th I think that there are We've, we've got work to do, but I also am just, uh, as I think I said in the keynote that I gave at the summit, your summit last year, I still continue to be just relentlessly optimistic, even in the face of some serious challenges. You know, I feel like if we don't stay optimistic that things can progress and that we can progress that together, then the other side wins, right? You, you can't not be optimistic and win too, and, and I'm going to win. Well, there's no doubt that you're going to win. And I think it's people in, uh, that have your energy and passion and organizations like RISE that, that lead that fight and, and continue to push that, that positive spirit because that energy is infectious and it encompasses so many other organizations along the way. And so one of the things that I, I want to talk about and, and ask you about from, for our network What's the best way for organizations to connect with RISE and to partner with you to provide some of those training and, and programs and be able to get that message out in areas that yeah. you, you haven't had an opportunity to work with yet? So I love that. We welcome that. Uh, we're built for that. So I encourage folks go to the website, our social media platforms, any of them. I promise you, if you reach out to us, we have a wonderful partnerships team. I think on the website, it's there's a plain, uh, flat out work with us type link on there. But if not, uh, David Schmidt heads our uh, partnerships team and they really are our front lines 
partnering with people, even envisioning that thought process. Okay, here are all the things we do. What can we do with you? How would that work best? We love doing that. We welcome that. Um, and, and David and his team then direct us correctly internally so that we're all do, you know, playing our right roles. So that is the easiest way. And even if you just go to the website and you forget all of that, and you go to uh, connect with us, and you see my picture. If you click on my picture, you'll end up at you'll end up there anyway. Well, and and there's so many great resources on that site. I think anybody who has an opportunity to go play on there, once you start looking around and going through the programs, you literally could spend uh, hours and hours looking at all of the materials and getting ideas for uh, incredible. Um, you know, as they say, crucial conversations and, yeah. and workshops and, and other materials that help open the door to those yeah. conversations that are so important to make change. Yeah. And I would, you know, I would add here, one of our commitments has been that we don't ever ask community partners uh, to uh, support us financially if they can't. So if you are an organization, especially if you deal with youth, diverse youth, uh, youth and law enforcement, you, if you reach out to us, don't worry about uh, the funding. In part, that's my job. And for the first time, we brought on a full-time fundraiser. So we raise money from the for-profit space to help us to provide services um, to other organizations. So I just don't ever want that to be a kind of an obstacle or a block. And we welcome folks reaching out to us. Well, Diane, I want to congratulate you on the incredible work that, that you're doing in your leadership and uh, the amazing team that you've been able to put together for RISE. So um, before we let you go, though, I do want to take a minute to put you on the spot here. And uh, we're going to use our sports philanthropy superpowers and, and wave our magic wand. And we're going to appoint you as commissioner of a sport. So uh, tell us what sport you want to take control of. I, you know, I struggle with this one. I, I think I get um, a chance to really see those guys. And, and right now they're all guys. So I'm prayerful that in the future, sometime we'll say those women and men uh, in these roles. You know, I, I think it comes down to, I generally am up for what's the most challenging. And so to me, the NFL or MLB feel the most challenging. Um, maybe MLB, because I see in that one league um, a, a racial diversity that maybe is different than the other leagues um, and has incredible power and ability to um, drive some of these social justice issues and such a um, just such a history, you know, of, of uh, being a part of our country, but it's, I don't know, that's a tough question, Roy. That's a tough so, question. Well, we're going to put you then, we'll install you in MLB. So Rob, Rob's been moved to the uh, retirement zone and you've taken no, over no. his office. Um, so now, now what's your first uh, action as commissioner? You get to put your stamp on the league. What's the first thing you're going to do? You know, what's interesting is I separated these questions. So let me tell you my answer to the question the way I thought about it, because it wasn't a rule. I thought about what rule I would change. Well, you can, that can be the answer. Okay. So my rule wouldn't be in baseball. It would be in international track and field. So for me, it would be rule 50. I, you know, rule 50 is the rule that prohibits athletes from making what they consider political statements. Um, on the on the kind of the winner stand during the Olympics. Um, and of course, I think that we've had some really great moments from Jesse Owens um, to, um, I'm forgetting Carlos's name, uh, that really moved this country that happened during the Olympics. To me, the Olympics represent this moment of sport transcending everything. And I think to block it, from also being able to convey protest is to kind of like limit the beauty and the power of what it is. So I would change, if there was a rule, I would change rule 50, so. Well, I think that's interesting because if you go back to the, the history of it, right? Originally it was there specifically to keep 
politics out of the sport because countries were using yes. their political agenda and they were trying to use their athletes to advance the country's political agenda, not yeah. the athletes' rights and the athletes' political agenda. And now it's completely flipped yeah. around. And it, it's really the opposite where the, the athletes are trying to it use really their is. form it's such a great and platform. Point. It's such a great point, right? We, we, you know, again, the only thing that stays the same is that things change. And so well, you're right, it has completely changed the role of athlete activism. Well, and I know things are not staying the same with you. You're, you're moving ahead very quickly. Rise is doing amazing work and creating and making that change. And uh, I wanna congratulate you again for everything that you continue to do. Thank you. Like I said, I got a great team. I have a great board that, you know, they make me look good. <laughs> well, it, it, it all works together. The team uh, makes a big impact. And we want to thank all of our team at Sports Philanthropy Network and all of our viewers and listeners. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Please remember to live generously. Thank you for having me.